everybody. Welcome back to HomeRecordingMadeEasy.com and here on my YouTube channel. And we're back with another Icon QCon Pro X video. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the basic controls, uh, show you a little bit about the transport section here on the master of on the on the main unit here with Studio One, and then also talk to you a little bit about um, some of the differences depending on the DAW that you're using and where some functions work in one DAW and but not in another. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. So before we get started, if this is your first time here, make sure you head out to homerecordingmadeeasy.com because again, we're talking about a mixing system here and I wanna give you a free mixing course worth about a hundred bucks. It's right on the homepage, you can't miss it. It's my gift to you just for visiting homerecordingmadeeasy.com. And also if you really wanna learn the craft of mixing, make sure you check what I have going on at mixingmadeeasy.net. That's my mixing membership training website. And if you stick around till the end of the video, I'm gonna give you something else for free and I'm gonna hook you up. We're all about mixing the last couple of months here, here at home recording me and easy. And with this icon QCOM Pro X, we're right in our wheelhouse. So let's talk a little bit about this. So if you have not seen the other videos as of yet for the QCON Pro X, check the playlist in the description box below. You'll get to see an unboxing video, a basic setup video, this video, and then by the time you're watching this, probably future videos, will be a whole host of videos in there to get you familiar with the Icon QCON Pro X. <clears throat> Pardon me. So this video, let's talk a little bit about the layout here. And I know some of the detail will be difficult to see and where it's appropriate, I might insert here some iPhone videos. So let me get my iPhone uh, camera here all ready to rock and roll in case we need it. Okay, so let's start off with Again, our basic configuration here is we have a 24 channel setup. We have the, the, the QCON Pro X, the main unit with the master section with eight faders. We have one bank of eight faders, the extender, one extender to the left and one extender to the right. Okay, you can go watch the other video where I show you how to set all that up. So we have 24 faders here. As Soon as I boot up Studio One, um, you'll see everything kind of snaps too. And if we just take a look at the screen here, the faders on the screen, everything moves. It's very, um, very smooth. It doesn't have any lag or any latency. What I'm doing on the controller is what is happening on the screen in real time. It works really well in that respect. These are touch sets in the faders, meaning if I touch a fader right above the fader, you'll see a little LED light on the camera. On your video, it may look white, but it's actually the color blue. So these are touch sensitive faders. Okay, now one of the things, there's a couple of things here that we wanna be aware of. Okay, we're working with Studio One because we have our Studio One metal insert plate here, the IMAP plate that we installed in the last video. It comes from the factory set up with the Cubase Uendo plate, which gives these master section buttons different functions. Aside from that, what I've been learning is Every DAW, at least the ones that I'm using, Studio One and Cubase, some of these features that work in one DAW don't work in another. And I'd like to talk you through that a little bit as well. So you can kind of get an understanding of what some features might work in one DAW may not work in another. So for example, as I mentioned, each one of these faders is touch sensitive. It's got the little LED light that lights up when we touch them. But as you can see in Studio One, you can see the faders moving. But what you don't see is you don't see the track being automatically selected. In other words, the track is not highlighted when I just touch a fader and move from one track to the other. You have to actually hit the select button, which we'll talk about the whole channel strip in a second. Then the track highlights. If I touch the fader to the left or the fader to the right, the faders will move, but the track select in Studio One does not move until I hit the select button, okay? What we'll see in a little bit when we fire up Cubase, in Cubase, as soon as you touch the fader, it automatically will light up the select button and automatically move in the screen on the console and it will light up the next track, which is really kind of convenient. One of the things that I don't like about control surfaces in general, all of them, I've tried them all. There are two areas that I find fall short. The first one, the biggest one is that whatever you're doing on the physical hardware doesn't always mirror on the screen in front of you. And that is not in this particular case, not a cause of the actual icon pro con pro uh, con Q or pro Q <laughs> icon Q con pro X. It's not really the control surface. It's actually depends on the DW that you're using. 
Some DAWs have some of that functionality built in, some do not. Um, and it's a real challenge for companies that make control surfaces to be compatible with every DAW and have all the same features and functions. Some companies are willing to work with, con with third party control surface manufacturers, some more than others, some get, you know, a little bit more um, possessive of their stuff. And if they make their own controlled surfaces, they may not be so willing to give up all the features and functions to a third party control surface, if that makes any sense. So one of the things that, and again, we'll show that that's one of the main differences. One of the differences is that when you touch these touch sensitive faders, it does not advance in studio one in the console and it does not advance the select button, but you'll see in a bit that it does do that in Cubase. So that's one of the things about if you're using studio one with this, it doesn't work that way, but they are touch sensitive faders. Okay. So let's walk through a channel strip. So every one of these 24 faders, we'll start with this one right here, just because it's in the middle of the screen. We have our select button for our track select. As we hit the track select button, you'll see in studio one, it does select the next track on the screen. That's really nice. Again, we want the screen to mirror what we're doing above that. We have our mute button. Okay. Then we have our solo button. Then we have our record arm button. So if you want to record arming, you could see my voice coming in on that channel because my microphone's plugged into the input here. Okay. Then above that, we have our pan knob. These are multifunction encoders. And right now it's set up to do panning. Okay. And if I pan it, say to one side and I just press it, it will go back to the center. These will also work for different features, which we'll talk about in a minute. That is the channel strip for every one of these 24 faders. Pretty straightforward. You would expect that. On the meter bridge, you have an LED. that are, from what I can see, pretty accurate, these LEDs, the meters are pretty accurate to the meters in Studio One. And although you can adjust those as well, and we'll talk about in a future video, how you adjust the sensitivity of the faders, the calibration, all of that. We'll talk about that in another video, but we have a nice meter bridge here as well. Um, one question that came up, and I think on our Instagram page or on our Facebook group, for someone who has this, is that if you notice this, main unit here has nine faders the eight faders for the channels and then the master fader here on the right hand side okay and you can see that in my mixer on the far right hand side in studio one you can see that it's moving up and down there's also a stereo led meter here which when i hit play no signal comes in on the master fader right the fader works but there's no led that also occurs in studio one when i talked to the support people over at icon they said again that is more of a it's more of a daw thing that the company has i guess it's something to do with the mackie protocol and the midi protocol and that several daws that doesn't work they, that has to be fixed at the daw level not at the cons not at the control service level however they claim with this uh QCon Pro X, there are certain DAWs where that does work. I think they said Bitwig and there's a couple others. I forget the list, but it does work. So they said it's not a defective unit. It's nothing to do with the QCon. It has to do with the DAW. So again, that may or may not bother you. It really doesn't bother me very much, but just be aware that you will not get on Studio One or Cubase, you will not get a meter here on the master fader. That's something that has to be done with PreSonus and or Steinberg and all the other DAWs where that doesn't work. Okay, so that is something that you want to be aware of here. Also here, um, again, you can't see it as well, but I will use the iPhone here for this. Um, we turn on this video. So we have two LCD screens. We talked about this in one of the other videos, depending on how you have the, some of the master section buttons chosen, which we'll talk about. We'll display here uh, the track names of every track. And then right now, this is the actual level of the fader. So as I move, this fader up and down, you will see the values on the overhead left change. Okay, pretty good. Um, when you have this, uh, when you have the master section, right now it's in panning mode. So if I turn the pan pot, it will change on the screen, but it doesn't change here. You have to change, there is a way to do that and I'll show you that in a bit. Okay, now we have a second LCD screen down here. And right now, again, with Studio One, and again, I believe this is a Studio One thing. All it does is says channels one through eight and then master icon QCon Pro X and the same thing over here. It's just channels one through eight. There is no display here on any of these three. 
Again, same thing I believe with Cubase. Again, this is a Studio One thing. You don't, this is not being used for anything. Again, it would be nice that if Studio One allowed to have some other information here, this almost makes this kind of useless. But again, some of this stuff has to do with the DAW. Okay, so that's the first thing uh, I wanna kind of show you here. Let me shut that off for a second. Okay, so that is that. Let's talk about the mat. Oh, and the other thing we have here as well, uh, again, up here by the LED, by the meter bridge, we also have controls to um, little, little screwdriver slots to control the brightness of the LCD screens, both screens, and then also the contrast of the text. So you can count, you can manually do that. So you can read them the way you want to see them. This is the way they're set out of the factory. They look nice and crisp and they're easy to read. So there was really no reason for me to adjust that. So that is that part of the video. So now let's come over to the master section here. Now, again, depending on which DAW you're using will depend on how these functions work. And this is the Studio One uh, insert. So they'll have some buttons that don't have any controls in the, at all, and then some of them have the what, what they are right underneath them. The first eight uh, faders, or excuse me, the first, uh, these bank of uh, eight buttons here, these are F keys, function buttons that you can program and map to do whatever kind of common tasks that you'd like to do. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Right now, some of these might be already pre-programmed. So if you look at the screen here, uh, one, um, I programmed to up and open and close the mixer. So by choosing F1, we open and close the mixer. Number two, opens and closes the browser. You can see that right underneath my video on the left, right hand side. Again, I'll show you how to do that. F3 was already programmed from the factory to do the console. F4 doesn't do anything right now. F5 will open up, you can add an insert to the selected track that you have. And we can cancel on that for now. Um, this also overheads inserts, that adds inserts as well. We could cancel that. How do we get rid of that? Cancel that for now. This one's not programmed at all. And there's also a shift key. So these eight buttons can really turn into 16 different custom functions. Eight on the first layer holding shift, they're, they're multi-purpose multi, button, multi uh, purpose buttons here. So you can see right here. And again, if you were to put another IMAP insert like the Cubase one, these things will have different functions depending on the DAW. And again, you can customize these at, top, at the top here. Underneath that, these buttons right here, and again, I know you can't see the text very well. I'll, I'll put, again, a little bit of a video here and hopefully in editing, I'll make this look halfway decent for you guys. So let me just show you what you got up here so far. So right now in the function keys, you can see what does what. F3 is supposed to add audio tracks. F4 is an audio insert. F5 will add a bus or an aux auxes, buses, masters, and tracks. And again, we could change all of that. And that's our shift key or our layer key. Underneath that, this gives us, this is our assignment row. Right now it's on panning. And when it's on panning, if I were to uh, turn the pan for the track that we have selected here, which is on the screen, it affects the panning. And you can see that on the screen here, uh, right on the track that's selected, the overhead left, you'll see that. If I switch this over to, uh, say, plugins, you'll see that the screen here goes blank because we don't have any plugins. And that's where we'll be able to map our plugin controls. And we'll talk about that in another video. If I go to sends, you'll see the LCD screen shows my sends. Right now, I have one send on the screen. I have a drum reverb. And now this will actually control the drum. This will actually control the send to the drum reverb. And if I were to shrink this down a little bit, and I'm apologizing here for the shaky video, but if you look up on the screen, I'll make the, the uh, QCon a little bit smaller so you can see the send level. So if you see the send level on this selected track that I have, and you can see the sends, I'm turning the send level up and down. See that? Because I have sends and you can see the value of it right here, okay? So these encoders, and if I press it to the center, it brings it back to zero, okay? So that's the sends. Um, and again, if I wanna go back to panning, I hit panning and now all the encoders are now back to panning. And if I press it, it'll pan back straight to the center. Um, underneath that, we have all for our selected track, we have our read, we have our read, our write, touch and latch, all our automation buttons are right here. 
Okay, so as I touch those buttons here, I'll shut that off for a second. As I touch those buttons, you'll see on our selected track, uh, we're going to, oops, sorry, we're going to panning, we're gonna go to read and you'll see it goes to read right where my cursor is here underneath uh, here for the selected track, you go to read, I could go to write. The center button doesn't work. There's nothing programmed to this one, touch and latch. Okay, so all your automation controls are right there. And if you just hit it again, you can shut it off and turn it off completely. These two outer buttons here where my fingers are, nothing is programmed to those right now. These buttons here, this is our save. So it's automatically saving the session. Or excuse me, that's a shift key. This is our save right here, saving a session. This is our undo redo. We have a cancel and an, and an enter button here as well. Okay. We have a marker button, which doesn't seem to work. I can't seem to figure out how to get the markers to place, but the button lights up. I'll have to check into that. And then we have an empty button here that doesn't do anything for Studio One, but for Cubase or one of the other DAWs, it will. Then under here, we have a way we could flip our faders. So right now we're set at panning is on our encoders and volume is on our faders. If I flip it, now our panning is on our faders. You can see on that selected track, we're using our fader to do the panning and we're using the encoder to do the volume. That's by using this button here. This kind of flips the, the encoders to the faders. That could be really helpful for send levels as well. You can do that all with your faders as opposed to the encoders if you like to work that way. Beneath that, we have our banking buttons here where we can bank over in banks of eight. Again, you don't see the console advance and I'll talk about that in a minute where you can bank one track at a time here and you'll see the faders moving here as well. Okay, so that is this top section. And once again, I will shoot a little video and somewhere insert this for you so you could see the detail of the buttons a little bit better. There's our banking buttons eight at a time. Here's banking over one fader at a time. Here is the fader flip button. This is a lock button, which will lock all these down. The marker button, which doesn't seem to work. We have our shift key here. We have our save and save as. If we use our shift key, it'll be save as. We have undo and redo right here. Cancel and enter buttons are here. Here is all of our automation buttons I showed you for Studio One. Here is our assignment for our encoders, track, send level, pans, plugins, and effects. These two buttons aren't working right now. And then all these eight keys are our function keys that we can use here. Beneath that, I'll turn this off here because you can see we have a full transport section here. Shut this off here. So right here we have our, you can look on the, well, maybe you can't see on the screen here. I'll have to move the, the uh, QCon out of the way. Let me move this down so you can see the actual playhead here. So we have our fast forward and rewind. We can manually kind of walk through fast forward and rewind. We have our, um, our loop, our, our loop range. You can see at the top of the timeline, I'm turning our cycle or our loop on and off. We want to set a loop, stop, play, stop record. We have a scrub button underneath here that would work in conjunction with the jog wheel, but studio one doesn't support scrubbing. So this doesn't work, but this does work in Cubase. I'll show you that we have our jog wheel here that you could see our playhead jogging along. And then lastly, down here, we have our zoom function keys, which will help us with zooming in and out of the tracks. So let me close our console for a minute here. So if I hit the zoom key in the center and I press the up and down keys, it'll shrink the tracks. It'll open and close the tracks. You could see that, right? And if I um, use the left and right, it'll zoom in on our, on our uh, edit screen and zoom out. So some people might like, I use these on the keyboard all the time, keyboard shortcuts to do this all the time. So it's nice and handy to have that here when you have the zoom button. When you don't have the zoom button and we open up our console here, these left and right arrows actually come track select. Let me move the QCon out of the way so you can see this here. So if you look at our console view, you can see we're selecting the tracks here by using the left and right arrows. And it's also changing the select button on the top of each one of the tracks. Now, what I like about this is you can see that as I go over to the right side, you can see the, con the the mixer view in Studio One is advancing over. It's scrolling over. So again, if I'm on track, uh, pardon me, track 26 here or track 24 here, it's selected and I'm visibly on track 24 and I can see it on the screen, right? If I walk back over here all the way back to track one, you'll see that it advances in the console view by using those buttons. 
if I use the up and down, it'll do the same thing. So it's just a matter of whether you, you want to use the up or down or the left and right. When you're in the mixer view and it's going left to right, you're going one fader to the other. That makes sense. If I were to close this, now if I go left to right, up and down, you'll see that it'll advance here as well on the screen. Oh, you got, I got to move. Got to constantly move this out of the way. <laughs> I apologize. So you'll see that as I'm selecting here, it'll select the tracks that way as well. Make sense? That makes sense, right? So let's open up the mixer view. Now, one of the things, another one of these things that I that doesn't seem to work with Studio One, let's say I'm going all the way back to track one here. We're on the kick drum. All the way on track one, and you'll see up here, it's on track one. I'm gonna make the cue count a little bit bigger here so you can see it a little bit better. Now, again, this works in Cubase, doesn't work in Studio One, and I'll show it to you in Cubase. <clears throat> if I go on the screen in front of me in Studio One, you'll see that I only have visibly 15 tracks. It's right down here, and then it runs off the screen because my, my computer monitor is only 27 inches. I don't have an ultra wide screen. So it, it, it tracked 15. If I go to, if I go to track uh, 15 here and hit select, it's right there. And you can see that it selects and I go back to track one, it's back to track one. But if I go to track 20, I can select track 20, but look at on the screen. The console doesn't shift over like it did when I was using the arrow keys. I can't see track 20. I can't see it. I have to come down here with my mouse and scroll it all the way over and there it is, or track 21, excuse me, okay? That's another big thing about surface controls that always bugged me. And this is again, not the function or the problem with the icon QCon Pro X. It has to do with Studio One. I'm on track 21. If I go back to track one, the console doesn't advance over. So I can't see track one on the screen, but I know it's working. And if I take my mouse and I scroll back over, there's track one. That's something that really needs to be fixed in PreSona Studio One because in Cubase, that works flawlessly. It worked in Studio One when we did the SoftTube Console One, and it's one of the big things. Again, for me personally, this is just a personal opinion. I'm here sharing my opinion with you folks, because that's what we do here. I wanna see on a surface control, when I touch something on the surface control, I wanna see the response on the screen. If I move to track 20, I wanna see track 20 on the screen. I don't want it to be like this, and then I have to come over here and scroll. That bothers me. That may not bother you, but once again, it's not a function of the QCon, it's a function of Studio One. It doesn't do it in the mixer view. However, if I close the console, watch something interesting. On the edit screen, I'm on track one, right? If I go to track 21, it will advance down here in this screen. It doesn't advance in the console view, but it advances here. If I make this, let me show you what I mean. If I make these bigger, right? Now I go to track one. Now I only see on the screen, oops, didn't mean to do that. I only see on the screen seven tracks, right? I'm on track one. If I go to track nine or 10 or 11, look what happens. It will advance for me, right? If I go to track 20, it advances for me. If I go to track one, it goes back up to the kick track, but it doesn't do that in the console view. Don't know why I talked to uh, the, the folks over at Icon. They said it's it's a it's a Studio One thing. So does that bother you? If that bothers you, and you're predominantly a Studio One user, you got to think about that before you make this kind of investment because that function does not work. And by the way, that function hasn't worked in five years. So getting Studio if they if they try <laughs> they haven't gotten it if they haven't gotten presonus to fix that in five years chances are it might not be fixed anytime soon for me that's personally for me that's a big deal now could I overcome it probably does it does it hurt the function of the unit in any way does it make this a bad unit because of it absolutely not but ju I just want you to be aware of it so there are certain things like that that are a little you don't get the same feedback on the screen when you're touching the controller with this, with Studio One, as you may with other DAWs. So now that we've walked through all of this and it's pretty simple, let me show you how to map. Or you know what we're gonna do? First, let's, um, before we do that, let me take a pause here. 
Let me put the Cubase plate on here and let me show you some of the differences and what some of the touch sensitive faders and some of the selecting and the scrolling that I just talked about. Let me show you that in this video. And then in the next video, we'll come back and we'll do programming to kind of keep these things nice and concise one topic at a time. So I'll be right back. Okay, guys, so now we're here in Cubase Pro 12. And I just want to show you about some of those little quirks that I feel make this more usable with something like Cubase than currently with something like Studio One. So let's first talk about the uh, sensitive or touch sensitive faders. So as you can see right now, we're on track one and you can see our kick track in the bottom of the, of the mixer view here in Cubase. If I touch track one, if I touch track two, look what happens. Watch the, watch the mixer in Cubase. It lights up and the track select on the QCon automatically goes to track two. If I touch track three, track four, track five, see that? That doesn't happen in Studio One. To me, that's a big deal. Again, I want to see a mirror image on that screen of what I'm doing on the hardware. That is really cool. Okay, that's great. Also, if I come back to track one, I can still use my select buttons like we were doing. I could still use my select buttons. But here's another big benefit to this. On the screen, you'll see there's only 16 tracks visible in my mixer view. If I come over here and hit track 24, it advances the console view in Cubase just like the soft tube console one did in studio one, right? That is huge. If I go back to track one, it advances it on the screen. Those two features in and of itself, for me personally, would make this way more usable with something like Cubase Uendo than currently with studio one, which breaks my heart. But again, it has nothing to do with the Icon QCon Pro X. It functions, it's a, it's a matter of the DAW itself. The other thing that you'll notice, if I, I put the Cubase insert in here now, and if I put the Studio One next to it and I get out my trusty iPhone, you will see that every single button has a function in Cubase where half the buttons in Studio One have no function. You gotta either program them or they don't work. Let me see if I could do this. So let me, again, I, I hope this will be bright. So here's, this, here's the Cubase one. Every button has an assignment, every single button. Again, these function buttons can be programmed, which we'll do in another video, but every single button, here's the Studio One plate. Half of these buttons have no functions, as you saw a little bit earlier, right? There's a bunch of them. There's two over here. There's a bunch of them down here. Again, all the function buttons, we can program ourselves, so that's not a big deal. Our assignment and our automation, one of the automation buttons don't work. So it looks to me, just by looking at this, that from the from the pre-mapped with this with the insert, it's already set up in Cubase. A lot of this stuff is already done for you. Some of that stuff, again, some of those buttons and stuff just don't function in Studio One. And I'm sure other DAWs you'll have some of the same thing. So again, it just appears to me that this is a little bit more usable with. Cubase, at least for the way I like to see things. I love the touch sensitive faders, how it selects the tracks. I don't need to press the button. Again, very, very smooth. It almost seems like to me too, just looking at the, the console in Cubase when I'm moving this fader, it almost seems like it's a little more snappy on the screen. I mean, the physicalness of this thing feels the same with Studio One or Cubase, but the faders seem to be a little bit more responsive in Cubase than in Studio One as well. Just by looking at this, if I hit play. Again, the metering looks about right, what's on the screen, which is what it's on the meter bridge. But as you can see, we have no master, LE, no master e, uh, LEDs on the meter bridge. As I said earlier, that's a function of it. Cubase, it doesn't work. Uh, the scrub feature does work on this. Right, you can hear it. Scrub feature works, does not work in Studio One. We could turn that off. All the other same functions are pretty much the same. We have our track, uh, our zoom, where we could zoom in and out on our tracks, just like before. If we take the zoom out, what does that do? Oh yeah, if we take the, let me uh, zoom in so you can see a little bit better. If we take the zoom off and we go left, we go up and down, that does our track select both in the console and on the edit screen right? 
Really cool. Okay, that's the up and down arrow. Uh, the right arrow, okay, the right and left arrow just goes, you can see it selects the events here in the, in the edit screen. So when I go left and right, it does nothing really in the console. It's more about you're now going from highlighting the track to highlighting the audio waveform, which is, which is you know, just a different way that it works, which is fine. Again, the loop feature, instill, play, stop, all of that stuff works exactly the same. Um, again, same thing as we have right now. We are in, I believe, pan mode, right? Yes, we're in panning. So if I turn, if I select that track and I come over here and pan, you'll see the overhead right is now panning. And even the panning feels a little bit more responsive, a little bit more snappy than Studio One, just a little bit. And not a big deal, just a little bit. We also have the ability with Cubase. And again, I'll do this in another video where you can open up you know, the, uh, their, you can open up the, the ch their Cubase channel strip with the EQ and stuff, and we'll do all that in another, f another thing. But we have all of those things all set up here, which is really cool. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys that. Um, basic layout, it's simple. It's got a simple transport control that's very functional with both DAWs, even though the scrub only works with Cubase. Um, again, even though the transport section and this master section has more functionality with the buttons, there is plenty with Studio One in the fact that we could program these buttons here, the F1, F2, F3, F8 keys. Right now, they're not doing anything here because we haven't programmed them yet. <laughs> um, we could program them to do whatever we want, open up our browser, open up our mixer, open up our edit screens. We can do all of that here. It's pretty straightforward. So that is kind of how you kind of walk through this. Again, it feels really good. People ask, you know, how does it feel? It, it feels, I gotta tell you, it just feels really good. This is a high quality piece of equipment. So regardless of what DAW you use with this, I think physically you're gonna get a great experience. What it's really gonna come down to for each individual user is your particular DAW and how the functionality is and what are, do you have some of these little quirks that work in one DAW that doesn't work in another? Um, but for Cubase, so far, this thing works really, really, really well from what I can see. So in the next video, what we'll do is we'll start talking about how we can map the function keys. We'll also talk a little bit about plugins and how we can program some of the third-party plugin parameters to some of the encoders. And not only can you program into the encoders, but then you can go ahead and you can flip like we did before with the panning, where now panning is on the faders. We can have our plugin parameters on our faders as opposed to our encoders if we wanted to do that. And then I'll show you a little bit more of some of the other functionality and how you could kind of customize this to your liking, which is good. The good thing about this platform is you can customize this pretty much to make it work any way you want it to work. So thanks for sticking around till the end of this video. I hope this was informative. If you're looking at this particular unit, and you can leave comments below and ask questions and I'll try to get the answers. As I said, I'm not an expert in this. I've only had this a few, like a week now. I'm just starting to get my bearings and learning some of the differences and kind of, again, bringing you my... I'm a new user, I'm not an expert in this. If you bought one of these and got these home, what are the most basic things you're gonna to need to know to get up and running and how does it work and how does it function and how do I get going in the right direction and how intuitive is it? How intuitive is the hardware to the software? That's huge. Um, and so, so far with Cubase especially, it's really, really great. So thanks so much for watching this video. As I said at the beginning, we're talking about mixing, right? We got a mixing system here. We got a mixing control surface. Um, I want you to go to homerecordingmadeeasy.com because I want to give you that free mixing course. It's a hundred dollar mixing course. It's right on the homepage. You can't miss it. It's my gift to you just for visiting homerecordingmadeeasy.com. You take that training course, you really dig my style of teaching. You want to check out one of my full length training courses. I want to help you there as well. I'll give you a 25% discount coupon code. That coupon code is YouTube25. Put that in at checkout. It'll take 25% off any one of the training courses. Again, all that information will be in the description box below. And then last but certainly not least, if you enjoy mixing, if you really want to learn the craft of mixing in a very non-technical way, perfect for beginners and intermediates, where you get a full training course every single month, a new set of multi-track files, you get time with me one-on-one, -on -one you get mix critiques and you get to join a community of other mixers who are all trying to get better at the craft of mixing and we have mixing contests and plugging giveaways and all kinds of stuff. Check out mixingmadeeasy.net. 
That is my mixing training membership website. All the links will be in the description box below. So until the next video where we take it a look a little bit deeper, we're getting a little more under the hood here with the Icon QCon Pro X. I've been Dave with homerecordingmadeeasy.com and mixingmadeeasy.net. And I'll see you guys in the next video.